What is Broncos general manager George Payton's duty to the coaches on the staff? That's something that Sarah Benninger and myself, we break down. Plus, Tim Jenkins joins us, and he dishes us the truth on the Broncos' offensive struggles, where they can improve on, and whether or not you could build a big enough case right now to let go of Pat Shermer. We break it down on today's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos. You are locked on Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's up, Broncos country? Welcome back into a brand new episode of Lockdown Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast here on the Lockdown NFL Network, your team every day from the South Stands to the end zone. I'm your host, as always, Cody Rourke, joined alongside by my co-host, Sarah Bettinger. Both of us cover the Denver Broncos for the Lockdown Network and Nine News. Make sure you follow and subscribe to this podcast, free and available everywhere you get your podcast. Take us with you on your morning commute while you're making dinner, on your drive home from work, or if you want to watch us on your TV, smartphone, or your computer, you can do it by hitting that subscribe subscribe button, turning on notifications, making sure that you are locked in every single day to the Lockdown Broncos podcast. But Sarah, my friend, hey, it's great to see you. Great to talk to you again. It's getting a little chilly now that the fall is fully here. It's raining, get a little bit of snow here and there here in Colorado. But man, one thing is for certain, always great to talk Broncos football with you and Broncos country. Always great. Love it. Love the engagement. Love the people who are listening and, and, and just firing back with us. And man, I'm excited about this jersey giveaway. I'm bummed that I can't win it, Cody, but it's all good. Somebody's going to be... Somebody <laughs> Somebody's going to be happy. Somebody's going to get a cool jersey. And I've caught that winning feeling again, Cody. You know, the Chicago Bulls are undefeated right now. They're 4-0. Oh, I know man. a lot of our listeners are Denver Nuggets fans. But, man, the Chicago Bulls are 4-0. They've renewed my optimism. They've renewed my just winning spirit. So here we go. A Washington football team. It's not just Jerry Judy that's coming for you. It's it's this winning vibe that I'm catching right now. Well, hopefully it trickulates down to the Denver Broncos on Sunday against the Washington football team. And, yes, we are doing a jersey giveaway. The winner will be announced during half. Halftime, we'll be doing a live video. We'll drop it on Twitter where we select one random listener. We're not going to select it. A, a program and an algorithm will, and you can win a jersey. Go to my Twitter feed, at Cody Rourke NFL. Check out the pinned tweet. Make sure you're subscribed here. You're following the Lockdown Broncos handle on Twitter, and that you're tuned in here on the podcast. But, uh, Sarah, look, let's go over some news and notes here. We've got a very special guest coming up here in just a little bit. That's our good friend Tim Jenkins. He's going to tell us a little bit about the Broncos' offensive struggles from his perspective, going back and watching the tape and seeing whether or not, hey, is the issue is it Teddy Bridgewater regressing? Is it the offense? Is the scheme? Is it all of it? He breaks that down for us a little bit later on here in the show. But get some Broncos news and notes here on the injury side of things. The Broncos back on the practice field four straight days of practice. Von Miller on Tuesday did not participate, and Vic Fangio said that he is day to day with an ankle injury. There is a chance that he can play on Sunday, and I think it's going to be a little bit more likely. He likely be a game time decision leading up to it. But not so good news for Mike Purcell, who did have surgery on the finger that he had severely injured in the Broncos loss to the Cleveland Browns. Vic Fangio says he does not expect him to play this week. And so an added workload for guys like Deshaun Williams, Stephen Weatherly, how much will he play, if at all? That's another factor that Vic brought up. So the defensive line is going to have a little bit of a hard time, I think. And we have to see somebody rise up, especially against the run with Purcell out there. Just generally here, Sarah, your thoughts on uh, the Broncos injuries real quick. Well, I think the, the the run defense, you know, takes another big shot. If, if Von Miller... If for for whatever reason can't play and like you mentioned in yesterday's episode you know he's scheduled to meet with the media at some point this week so that's usually an indicator that a guy's going to play but man if if both von miller and mike purcell are out plus your two starting inside linebackers plus now one of your top backups that that gets you a little concerned about run defense going up against a washington team that you know if antonio gibson i don't know if he's going to be healthy enough to play in this game we'll see even a dinged up Antonio Gibson, I feel like could run on what the Broncos have put forth in terms of run defense lately. So even with Mike Purcell, it's been a bit of a struggle, but it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how they switch things up. You know, like you mentioned when we were off air just now, where's Deshaun Williams been, you know, what's, what, what's going on there? The plays, the plays need to be made by somebody Cody. And I hope these new guys get a chance to play this week. I hope we finally get to see some more from, from some offensive guys as well. John Brown specifically, I hope we get to see more, from him but man if, if players on the defense can't go I think that could you know that could really tip things in the favor of Washington unfortunately but we need to see we need to see these guys with that rejuvenated fire right we need to see guys like Von Miller out there on the field it's great to know that his injury is not long term so somebody will step up Jonathan Cooper you know Stephen Weatherly somebody will step up in the absence and and they'll get it get it figured out somebody's going to be making plays this weekend 
And there's one player, too, that could return this week from injury. That's Baron Browning had to go through concussion protocol. And Vic Fangio said on Tuesday he has to have a good practice on Tuesday in order to really fully clear the hurdle of the concussion protocol, which is you know crazy seeing him in concussion protocol, not Patrick Mahomes, who should be in concussion protocol from the massive shot that he had taken. But the NFL has specific rules for specific players. Uh, but for Baron Browning, he did also say that he's going to have to take on a large load of that responsibility on the defensive side of the ball. Kenny Young will have to get acclimated. And Vic said that, you know, I've got to see him practice first to see whether or not we're going to put him in the game here on Sunday, which you don't want to put a guy out there that has no idea what your defense is or is not up to speed, at least on the basic stuff that you can run, that you can put him out there in those situations because then he's going to look lost. So I think that the coaching staff, this is going to be a big week for them. And not to mention it's going to be a big week for them in general because of the fact they have to figure out how to turn this losing streak around four straight games is not ideal. But it also goes to a bigger question here, Sarah, real quick. And I think our good friend Benjamin Albright had put it out there perfectly about the Broncos, George Payton, and his role with the coaching staff right now. And I'll leave it at this. Ben had he was asked a question on Twitter about whether or not uh, George Payton should step in and just do everything necessary to relieve the coaching uh, staff of their duties here. And, and Ben answered with, look, George Payton's responsibility as a GM and his duty to them, which I completely agree with and, and it's spot on, is the fact that as a GM, you go to your coaches, you say, what do you need to be successful? And you go out and you deliver that. So when Jerry Judy went down with an injury, what did he do? He went out and he looked at wide receivers. He picked up wide receivers. He stole them off practice squads. He added depth there. So same thing with linebacker right now. So he's doing everything that he can as a GM to give them what they need, but it's on the coaching staff in order to deliver. If that doesn't happen, changes will be made at the end of the season, or if it gets really bad, could happen in season, sir. So I just wanted to leave that with Broncos country because I know that's a big talking point here for our listeners in the comment section, something we interact with quite a bit. So uh, appreciate that insight there from our good friend Benjamin Albright here of Locked On Broncos, a good friend of the show. But ladies and gentlemen, coming up here in just a moment, we're going to be joined by another good friend of the show. It's a good friend over there, Tim Jenkins of Jenkins Elite. He talks to us about the Broncos offense, Teddy Bridgewater, Pat Shermer, and all the above. All your questions that you have about the Broncos offense, he answers, he breaks it down. We'll get to that coming up here in just a moment. But before we do that, let me tell you about the sponsor of today. Today's episode show it's a good friends over there at get upside and with the rising gas prices all across the nation one thing is for certain that is the get upside app can help you negate that blow that you're going to take in your wallet there because they actually put money back into your wallet with the get upside app where you'll never have to pay full price ever again at the gas pump and if you use promo code touchdown they're going to give you a 25 cent per gallon cash back bonus every single time you fill up and if it's your first time using it that promo code touchdown is going to get you up to 50 cents per gallon cash back today when you fill up your tank with the Get Upside app, which you can download. It's free and available in the Google Play Store, the Apple Store, wherever you get your apps, they have you covered with the Get Upside app. And if you travel a lot like me, especially here in the winter, you can make up to $200 to $300 back in cash back per month alone, depending on how often and how much you drive and how often you have to fill up your gas tank. And you can cash out easily with your bank account, PayPal, Amazon, or other gift card brands. They make it easy for you to take advantage of that today with the Get Upside app. So once again, use promo code TOUCHDOWN. It's going to get you an additional 25 cents per gallon cash back today when you sign up using the get upside app here on the lockdown broncos podcast as always we're thrilled to welcome back in tim jenkins he uh, no, had a well-deserved two-week vacation uh, in <laughs> disney with the kids with the family well-deserved he puts in a lot of work with high school athletes college athletes pro athletes i know he was excited you got to see pj walker get in on sunday against the new york giants unfortunately the, you know the game didn't go the way the panthers wanted but good to see pj out there tim how you doing my man i'm doing great yeah i always i, I joke around now because you know when all i did was train guys the season is your time to hang out because the off season is when you're the busiest and now that i have started doing the breakdowns that's just like 24 7 you don't really get a break at all so yeah, I had to uh, go enjoy it. I, I don't know if it was really a vacation. Lugging around a five-year-old, a two-year-old, <laughs> a one-year-old, and then my wife is pregnant at Disney World. Ooh. It's like, I don't know if you call that a vacay, but there was some, uh, it was team building. It was good team building for the family, and, and we got out of there alive. Love to see that. You know, let's uh let's dive into all the action here. Obviously, the big story too. I know Broncos country has been eager for your thoughts. They've been in the comment section. When is Tim Jenkins coming back? And I say, hey, look, he's on vacation. We're gonna get him back in here. But the biggest thing, look, the four straight games the Broncos have dropped. A lot of it too. Defense has struggled. They've carried their their big part of the blame. But the offense has also struggled as well in comparison to the first three weeks of the season. In your opinion, going back and watching the last couple of weeks, first off, what's been going on with Teddy Bridgewater? 
in his performance. Coming into the Thursday night game against the Browns, he was a little banged up, wasn't 100% coming into that, but did that have any kind of merit as to the outcome, or is it just simply that Teddy's regressing? Yeah, I think it's a great question. When you The thing that's hard with Teddy is when you watch the TV copy, right? When you're watching it live, it doesn't look bad. You're not like, oh, okay, this – you're just more like the offense isn't moving, which leads you to think the coaching's not great, right? That's what I always think when I'm watching. If a quarterback's completing the ball, usually you're like, okay, you give him benefit of the doubt. Then you start looking at the all-22 and you go, okay, we've got guys – open downfield right so there's third and nine plays where it's like okay we've got the deep hank and then the shallow and okay he throws it to the shallow and then there's there's blame to be placed everywhere because Noah fan doesn't make somebody miss right so yeah. it's hey third and nine you catch the ball at six yards it's you versus someone else you'd like to think you could make someone miss and get three right but we're not but then you compound that by looking at what the deep hank looked like behind it and it was wide open so it's one of those things where it's like, man, it's hard to it's hard to really make the case from a coaching standpoint, like our quarterback isn't executing our offense. Because I'm willing to bet that they read that thing shallow to deep hang. So if the shallow's there, you throw it. There is something to be said, though, of like, can we get another element by getting someone maybe a little bit more aggressive under center? And that's something that it's like the nuance of this conversation it's not simply Shermer sucks, Teddy sucks. Like that's not the that's not it because the plays are designed well. There are guys, you know, there's a third and I want to say it was third and nine that he throws to Noah Fant on a, what we would call like a bang wide where you chip the D end and then get out. And it's like John Brown, right? John mm -hmm. Brown, not Josh, John Brown is like wide open on an ultra high. So it's like a spinoff. They run a ton of Flutie, which is post-sale, right? A lot of people call it scissors. It's a spinoff of Flutie. Instead of having a post, he goes to the post and then kicks it and runs the ultra high, and the sale comes underneath. Corner sat, or corner gave ground, right? That's why he threw the flat, but sat on the sale. The ultra high is wide open, but we don't throw it. We throw the, we throw the, uh, the, the bang wide, and then all of a sudden we get six and we punt. So it's like, man, there's stuff out there that from – I'm not ready to throw Shermer under the bus from a design standpoint because, you know, third and nine is hard enough. But if you're scheming guys open in the NFL on third and nine, I like to think you're doing a pretty good job. So it's a it's a tough conversation right now. But I think from where I'm sitting, I don't think Teddy's regressing. I just think the level of competition is to the point where like, OK, here's a great example. How many times let's say it was I think it was three that we threw to Noah Fant short of the sticks and he didn't get it against Cleveland. But we were all singing his praises for throwing the stick route to Noah Fant against the Jaguars that Noah Fant catches, makes somebody miss and scores, right? So I don't necessarily want to say I think Teddy's regressing. I just think now they're facing people that you don't score throwing a stick route when you're 12 yards out, right? It's just they make a tackle. They're a good defense. So those are the things where it's like, I don't know if he's regressing, but I just there's a lot left out there that would be kind of frustrating if I was the coordinator. Absolutely. And I think you brought up a great point, Tim. And, I, and I've seen you make this point on Twitter as well. And you just referenced it, Pat Shermer and his play designs. And Cody and I touched on this in a previous episode as well, where we talked about, you know, referencing your videos and, and breakdowns. It's not like Pat Shermer is designing bad plays. It's not like every play on third and nine is designed to go seven or eight yards. However, that being the case, I think where the frustration is coming in is, like you said, the lack of the lack of aggressiveness on Teddy's part, missing open receivers downfield, but also how would you assess Pat Shermer and just the way that he calls a game? Because I think yeah. I think we need to make that distinction between he's how the way that he's calling a game and getting blamed for being a you know a crappy offensive coordinator to put it as you know lightly as I can from what we've get, yeah. gotten in the comments and things like that, but <laughs> just running a game from a play calling perspective. And, and play designs and how that flow should be going, how would you assess where Pat Shermer's at right now in that regard? I mean, dude, that's a great question. And here's where, here's where I come down. There's two things that go into being a coordinator. Play design, right, which I think, boom, he's checking the box. I think we're designed well week in and week out. Like we're attacking the correct aspects of the defense. Then there's the calling, which by and large is probably a bigger deal, right? Like, hey, can you actually, you know, call the game the way it's flowed? I think the biggest indictment, so for me, if I was to say, if you were to say, hey, Tim, paint the argument to move on from Shermer. 
the biggest argue, the biggest point to moving on from Shermer is the fact that go back all the way to last season too, include it, right? Their scripted offense sucks. If your first 10 isn't good, like that's as easy as it comes, right? Like you're like if when you script it, you have a plan, you know what they're gonna be in on PN10, you know everything that's gonna happen by and large. Your script is just wrong. So that's kind of like if you were to say, okay, make the case against Shermer, it's that the script has been so bad. Again, right? It, the script being bad is relative because of well, there's guys that are scripted open. So it's like, okay, is the script bad or are we not executing? But if you're not going to move on from the guy, then you just have to assume that, hey, we're running the offense the way I'm okay with it, and, and it's still not effective, right? Because at the end of the day, Cody knows this from coaching. You either coach it or ha- to happen or you allow it to happen, right? There's yeah. not you, – you can't pin it on the players then, right? You either coach it to happen or you got to demand it. There's just like – there's no in between. The greats do it no matter who you are. If you're great at the high school level, the youth level – I benched my own son this last weekend in flag because he didn't get the alert check right. Like, it doesn't matter, right? You've got to be willing to hold these guys accountable. So it's a great question. I think the script would be the indictment against Shermer. And then I think you mix in all the other things. Because to me, it's like, okay, so running the football right now is a big talking point in Denver. I personally don't really care about how many times you run. But when you start stacking all these things up of like, man, it feels like we get away from run early. Man, it feels like our script sucks. It feels like our offense is best when we're just simplified running four verts and no huddle. As you start to add them up, that's where it's like, okay, maybe he's the problem, right? There's some ways that it's not like one thing for me. But when you add them all up, then you start to go, okay, maybe he's not the perfect guy for this team. But, you know, I'm, I'm a quarterback guy, so, of course, I could give two hells about running the football. Like, I've always loved running the football for play action. But I also view it as, like, you know, listen, we were, when I was at Fort Lewis, we'd, we'd run the ball eight times a game, and we still were great with play action because you know, everybody knows, right, the defensive guys, they're trying to get downhill and hit somebody. They don't realize that you've only ran it six times. So I think it's all relative in terms of, like, that's not a reason to move on. But when you factor in everything, it's like, man – now it's really kind of building against, you know, Coach Shermer staying. It's that red flag uh, trend that we're seeing right now on social yeah. media in Broncos <laughs> country. Coming up here in just a moment, both Sarah and myself, we're going to continue our conversation with Tim Jenkins, who's taking time out of his day to join us to talk Broncos offense and more. But before we do that, let me tell you about the two other sponsors. Today's episode of the show, that's your good friends over there, BetOnline.ag and Built Bar. BetOnline.ag is back, and they're better than ever. Week 8 of the NFL season is here, plus the start of the NBA season. They have you covered. They're the number one source for all things pro basketball, pro football, college football, all the above from NHL, MLB postseason, football games, Thursday night football, Monday night football, college football games, UFC and MMA action, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. BetOnline is the number one source for all things betting. You can go there right here today, BetOnline.ag, and they have a new updated site and interface, which makes it easy for you to navigate to find the latest odds, props, and the contests that they have in store for the weekend or for your day-to-day action, betonline.ag. BetOnline is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports action. BetOnline, where the game starts, and our good friends over there at Built Bar, the best-tasting protein bar on the market. A protein bar that tastes like a candy bar, has no taste like a protein bar. You take a bite into a peanut butter brownie, you know what you're going to taste? Peanut butter and brownie, not to mention the churro puffs. And for the month of October, they have limited time offers on some new flavors, three to new flavors every single week at built.com. So check it out today. Pumpkin spice puffs, that's something that's coming out. Coconut brownie chunk is a great tasting one. If you're a coconut fan, they have a flavor for everybody there at built.com, not to mention the healthiest protein bar on the market. Like I mentioned earlier, 17 grams of protein, 130 calories, only four grams of sugar in each built bar. That is the best value here. Perfect blend between something that's healthy and dessert. All at built.com. And when you go to built.com, get yourself a box today for you and the family. Use promo code LOCK15. It's going to get you 15% off your next order at built.com. Once again, promo code LOCK15 gets you 15% off your next order at built.com. 
Com. All right, jumping into fourth quarter action. Today's episode, Lockdown Broncos. Once again, Broncos country, thank you so much for making this show your first listen of the day every single day. Very fortunate right now to be joined here by our good friend Tim Jenkins. And Tim, as we go through and we look at the offense just in general, we address quarterback a little bit, some of the things that maybe Teddy's missing. Uh, one of the bigger questions I wanted to ask you is because there could be some reinforcements coming back this week for the Broncos on offense. And, and we talked about a couple of things as is if the script is not very good, it's hard to get in rhythm. It's hard to get into a flow as a play caller what does the addition or the return of a guy like jerry judy maybe do to help maybe amplify some of those struggles and some of those issues that they've had i think it's make or break right i think any reasonable person watched the film and went man i would not love to have to live in 12 personnel with my two receivers being tim patrick who i i like both of them but tim patrick and sutton don't really give you anything different between the two of them so it's like you're in 12 personnel but really you just have two x's right? Like, it's not like there's a guy like Jerry Judy getting him back. It's kind of like, okay, now you really got to show us what you are, right? Because it's like, when you get him back, you have to be able to deal with one injury and KJ Hamler. I get that when you lose KJ and Jerry, it's like, okay, this is tough. Now with Jerry Judy back, I think it's like, you got three weeks, right? I think the bye, when's the bye week? The bye week is, isn't it? Week, week? 11. Yeah. So to me, it's like, okay, you got the next, you got until where you got the next three games to show us what it's like with Jerry Judy. To me, I also think I, that would kind of be my stance on Teddy as well. Like Teddy, maybe it'd be a shorter hook, but to me, it's like Shermer. Okay. You got three weeks to really show us like that you're going in the right direction. Cause if you get Jerry Judy back and it still looks anemic, like nah, it's not kind of on you at that point. If we start to see more of those explosive plays that we saw earlier in the season, or you start to really see them be able to dial some things up, then I think it gives you a little bit of hope. Like, okay, well, maybe they're going to make a run now. Um, but with that said, man, it's just it, – I, I, like, I, I, I try to be positive. You guys know me. I'm not really a negative yeah. guy. But, like, dude, watching the Cleveland game, it was just like – it just wasn't good. It was just Sad. like – it was so tough. And then you go and watch the film and you're like, but there were guys open and it's just like – Something's not getting communicated effectively or something's just like, or that's just really how Shermer coaches, which is, Hey, if the flat is there, take it. And if that's what you're doing, you got to go to, cause that just, you, it's an easy, it's an easy thing to fix that hasn't been addressed. And it's not like it was like, Oh, well, he just started doing it. He did it in the preseason, the preseason we talked about Teddy in the boot mm -hmm. action, taking the flat. So it's not like this is something that we're like, Oh, this is new. It's been going on for 10 weeks. Yeah. So if you haven't coached it yet in the three preseason and the seven regular season, you're just – it's tough. It is. It's really tough. And everybody in Broncos country is looking for someone to blame. It doesn't matter who it is. We get blame for, well, the team needs an owner to the, the offensive line. You know, the offensive line stinks. I personally, Tim, from what I've seen, I, I think the offensive line is way less to blame than, than what people are saying but you can you can call me out if I'm wrong about that. Tell me I'm wrong. From your film study in the last few weeks with Teddy Bridgewater really struggling, I mean, he's thrown a number of interceptions that seem uncharacteristic from what we had seen from him early on in the season. He's taking a lot of sacks. He's taking a lot of hits. And look, the offensive line does deserve some blame for that. But tell me, tell me if I'm wrong, Tim. I feel like that's a lot more on Teddy Bridgewater than the offensive line lately. I think the truth is, I think Teddy holds the ball. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. I think there's a lot of quarterbacks in the NFL that hold the ball, right? Because they're looking for something downfield. And I think Teddy, when he's driving the ball down the field, rightfully so holds on to it. I think the issue that we've seen lately is he's holding on to the ball and then it results in throwing the flat. I do think the O-line, I mean, could every O-line in the NFL block better? Yeah. But we're not like seeing a ton of free runners, right? We're seeing pocket but like there's an I mean there was another clip that it was like okay hey if we take a three-step here we're going to create some space instead he took a one skip and he hitched back up into the pocket and people are like well his right guard's getting blown up it's like dude if you think that's a right guard getting blown up you've never tried to engage a 300 pound human while you're also <laughs> moving backwards like he gave up like three yards on his kick step that's like jack nothing so to me it's like you're, you're dead on. I, like, listen, could they play better? Of course. Every O-line in America could play better, right? Because ideally you never get hit. Not 17 times against the Raiders, right? 
but there's so many conversations to be had about holding on to the football or a running back missed assignment or just schematically. Like, it's not like, is it the O line's fault if, if Crosby's one on one with Noah Fant? I don't think so. I think that's a tight end issue, but more, but more, it's a scheme issue. So to me, it's like, I, I really do think, like you're saying, I don't think the O line is playing bad. Now, I don't think they're playing like the best football I've ever seen from an offensive line, but I think they're playing good enough for a quarterback to not feel like it's really affecting their play down in and down out. I I think those are some valid points that you make as well, and especially on the one skip too. For example, if you get a three-step drop on that, you have more time to sit there in the pocket. If you take that one skip, you're really stepping into the pocket, and the pocket, obviously, you know, there's going to be that natural pressure where guys are coming back with their kick steps. And so you're really just stepping up into your lineman, which then in turn creates space where you cannot escape. And and we know that's very important too. I think for any quarterback having the ability to say, Hey, this ain't working. I can escape. I can get out. I can roll out, dip it, throw it out of bounds or take it up and, and try to secure it there. But you know, some of these things we're seeing from the Broncos, I think pose a lot of interesting questions, obviously a tough matchup against the Washington football team defense that, you know, even though they've struggled this year, it still presents a challenge when your offense is struggling in and of itself. And we look forward to having you back next week, Tim, to break down the Washington football team game, and we'll see what's next here with this Broncos offense.